Well, we're going to hear our scripture reading now as we continue in Luke chapter 12. And Gary is going to read for us from Luke 12 verse 35. Watchfulness, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the... the the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Uh, over the, the past few weeks, in the passages that we've been looking at, um, there's been a very strong theme of stewardship. So back in chapter 11, uh, Jesus spoke to the people about their rejection of truth as revealed in himself. Because of their heritage, their access to the law and the prophets, they would find themselves condemned by Gentiles who had heard and responded to God. And the, the criticism increased as Jesus addressed the Pharisees and other religious leaders. They had been given so much in spiritual terms Yet not only did they fail to respond to it correctly, they actually directed others away from God. And they were failing as stewards. Then at the start of chapter 12, Jesus spoke about how disciples should live in response to what they saw and heard. Knowing and fearing God, they should not hide their allegiance or had no reason to be afraid of confessing Jesus before others. It's also about stewardship, about what we do as disciples with the truth that has been entrusted to us. And then last week we were thinking about stewardship in relation to money and possessions. Not being greedy or anxious, but valuing the kingdom and trusting God to provide everything that we need. And if you look at the flow of Luke chapter 12, there is no break in the narrative into this passage. There's clearly a connection here and Luke's wanting us to, to run through this. But the focus is shifting. The focus is shifting to the future. There's, there's, there's enough in this passage that we can be clear that Jesus is thinking, at least primarily, about his return. The disciples may not have fully understood this at the time. And some have suggested that he's, he's speaking more about the cross and the resurrection. But there's enough of the language here that is repeated through the New Testament that makes it clear it, it is uh, primarily about his return. And in light of that, in light of this future, Jesus is calling disciples to be good stewards of all that we have received. 
And actually, this is such a, a powerful antidote to the, the greed and anxiety and hypocrisy and the fear of man in the previous passages. This future hope is so important in breaking these ties to the world. So we're going to look, first of all, at how Jesus calls us to be watchful and then how we're called to be faithful. So Jesus begins with a parable about a, a man who has gone off to a wedding. Now, the latest that I've ever come home from a wedding was about 3 a.m. in the morning after the wedding. Um, that's one that was on probably the other side of the country, so a long drive home. Um, that might seem quite late, but a Judean wedding could last a week. So there was no knowing, really, when the guests were going to leave and go home. Can you imagine being the host of that wedding? So these servants, literally they are bond servants, which is a form of slavery. So we, we can read this pretty much as saying slaves. These servants, they just could not know when their master would come home. And yet what we see is that they stayed ready. Their robes were tucked into their belts. Uh, that, that, that's in a really interesting phrase. I'll not go into it in too much depth, but um, it's a phrase that's used in Exodus twelve eleven. Uh, in reference to God's people being prepared to leave Egypt. Robes in those days, their clothes were, were sort of quite long robes and you can't really work if you're going to trip over your clothes. So it is both a, a sort of common reference to uh, how people would, would dress ready for service, uh, but there's also possibly something deeper in there in relation to the Exodus passage. So they were dressed ready. Whenever the master came, they wouldn't need to sort of tuck their clothes in and we would say roll up their sleeves. They were just ready. Also refers to the lamps burning. They ensured the lamps were topped up with oil, were constantly burning so that when the master came, even if it was in the middle of the night, the house would be lit and ready for him. They were always on watch. As soon as he returned they could offer him a proper welcome home. And this is speaking about disciples. And as, as we wait for Christ to return, as we wait for everything that he has promised, everything that we long for to be fulfilled, this speaks to us about the manner in which we wait. Waiting is not a passive thing. It's not lethargic. It's not despairing either. We know that he will come. We anticipate it with joy. We prepare ourselves, as 1 John 3 says, in the hope of his appearing, we purify ourselves as he is pure. We seek his grace to make us more like him. And we serve. We serve actively. Some have suggested, and I think there's probably something in this, some have suggested that the continually burning lamp is an analogy for the gospel, the light of revelation. The church is called to keep the light of the gospel burning through its preaching and witness. This is how we wait. And there's a wonderful surprise in this parable. We've seen how the servants wait and then we get a surprise or, or they get a surprise. Because I'm sure the master would be blessed by this welcome as he comes home perhaps in the middle of the night and sees all the lights on, the servants, ready to welcome him home. But actually they're the ones who are most blessed by his return. They've done their duty. They're prepared to continue doing their duty. But the master enters the house. He invites them to the table. He tucks in his own garments. He rolls up his own sleeves and he provides a meal. A banquet for them. It's an amazing picture. And there are so many things that it causes us to think of in relation to scripture. And the, the first place it takes my mind to is John 13. We read the remarkable account of Jesus at the Last Supper. And, and that act that only John records. Jesus removes his outer garments. And he wraps a towel around himself to wash his disciples' feet. The master is dressed for service. 
And it, it's a beautiful act. And, and Jesus draws out one particular um, meaning behind it. It speaks of the service that disciples should offer to one another. But there's much more in there as well. It's a symbolic act of all that Jesus did in coming to earth. Philippians 2 reminds us that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held onto, even though it was rightfully his. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That word for servant in that passage, it's the same word that Jesus uses in Luke 12. He made himself a slave. And we could also look to Matthew 20 verse 28. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that act of service in taking off his outer garment, washing their feet, it speaks of his whole ministry service as our saviour but it's also a prophetic act remember that at the same table a little bit later Jesus had washed their feet they sat down to their meal and later on Jesus gave them the cup and he said I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom so in that meal he is thinking both of his Immediate ministry, the cross, but he's also looking forward. He's thinking of the day that he would welcome his faithful disciples to an eternal feast. And again, we see a resonance here with this passage in Luke. The master, he dresses himself ready for service. He sits his servants down for a banquet. Listen to Revelation 19. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a a wonderful hope of an eternal feast. And what does Jesus say? Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. What a wonderful thought. But Jesus goes on here, and with this wonderful thought in our minds of the Master serving the servants, he does give a warning. And the warning comes as he speaks of the uncertainty of the time of his coming. He uses a new image in in verse 39. If the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. Now, of course, uh, thieves don't tend to advertise what time they're going to be in the neighbourhood. So wise owners, wise homeowners, take precautions to be as prepared as they can at any time in case the thief should come. Now, of course, we have an advantage Because we know that Christ will come. I was reading some interesting uh, little statistics about how often the New Testament speaks of Christ's return. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament and there are 318 references to Christ's return. On average it is referenced once every 25 verses. And the only books in the New Testament that don't mention Christ's return are Galatians, which has a very, very specific focus, and 2 and 3 John, which are in very short letters. Of all those references, six of them, including this one here in Luke and the parallel in Matthew, six of them refer to Jesus coming like a thief. His return is sure, it is certain, the New Testament is so clear on this. But we don't know when. 
We don't know when, but it's sure so. We should always be prepared. The world will not be prepared. But as we will see later in Luke 12, probably next week, and in Luke 21, the signs are there for us. Christ is surely coming. He's coming soon. So we must be prepared. Living as new creations. And I want to just finish this little section with another passage about waiting from Titus 2. Another passage which speaks of how we wait as people who are made new in Christ. This is Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. We wait. We're watchful. We are prepared as we seek God's grace to live Christ-like lives. And that's, it, it is very much connected with the emphasis in this next section, which is on faithfulness in the waiting. Peter speaks up, as, as usual, he's the, the spokesman for the apostles, and they've heard Jesus' call to be ready, and he, and he says, look, we, we need to understand something. Are you speaking to everyone, or is this specifically for us? Jesus, rather than giving a simple yes or no answer, he, he tells another parable. And this parable reveals the answer, but also deepens our understanding of what it is to be faithful servants waiting for his return. Again, we have a master going away. And this time the focus is on a servant that is left so a, a, a slave who is left as manager over his fellow slaves, if you like. He's a household steward. He has got the master's authority to act. And he is to ensure that everything in the household runs well. Now this steward has two options. Firstly, he can take his responsibility seriously. He can do his job well. He can be, as Jesus describes it, faithful and wise. Now it's interesting, the example of what this means that Jesus gives is that this uh, faithful and wise servant who is set over the household gives the other slaves in the household their portion of food at the proper time. Jesus doesn't mention any other of the household responsibilities. He refers specifically to how this manager, this steward, treats his fellow servants, his fellow slaves. A key sign of good stewardship is good treatment of those that they're left with to care for. Now this element of care for others, it points us to the fact that Jesus is speaking particularly to the apostles, to the leaders among his disciples, to those who have the uh, particular role of feeding his sheep, as he puts it. The particular role of teaching and caring for the church. But that doesn't mean that the rest of, us, the rest of you can switch off. Because... As part of the local church, we all have a degree of responsibility for one another's spiritual health and growth. So this applies to all of us within the church. There is undoubtedly a greater responsibility, in terms of what Jesus says here, a greater responsibility on leaders. But it does apply to all disciples and how we care for one another. So we have this faithful steward. His faithfulness expressed in his care for his fellow servants. And we see the result of this as well. He is rewarded. The steward is blessed. 
Because when the master returns, he will set him over all his possessions. Now, we don't actually know what Jesus is referring to exactly in this increased authority. It's not totally clear. But the New Testament does speak of reward and indicates that there are degrees of eternal reward for God's people. Those who are particularly faithful as stewards are rewarded as such. And so we should long for God's approval. We should work wholeheartedly at whatever he calls us to do, however small it seems. It's a reward that is good to seek. But it's also important to remember that these rewards are not going to cause friction among God's people. There will be no jealousy in heaven. We will be in the presence of God and each of us will have fullness of joy for eternity. Those who are rewarded the greatest rewards will not delight in themselves that they've earned this, but they will be delighting in the joy of the Lord. And we also remember that there's no limit to God's capacity to reward. The rewards that are offered his disciples are not things that we compete for, like medals in a race. And so this whole idea of being rewarded for faithful stewardship, it should actually encourage us to help one another. Yes, it encourages us to to work wholeheartedly for the Lord, but it should also encourage us to help one another. Brothers and sisters, members of one another, as Romans 12 says, we should help one another by stirring one another up to love and good deeds so that we are all rewarded. But of course this passage doesn't just speak of the faithful steward, the rewarded steward. Jesus also warns that the steward can take another path. That servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. This slave despises the goodness of the master. He dishonours him. He abuses his position. He abuses the very things that he is supposed to be caring for. He abuses the order of the house that he is supposed to be set over. And he abuses his fellow servants. We're reminded often in the New Testament that there will be many who appear to be disciples. But their lives prove otherwise, including church leaders. There are those who abuse their privileged positions, who abuse the people that they are supposed to be caring for. There are many examples of this through history. It seems in the age of the celebrity pastor or celebrity leader, these have become almost more common. Um, Those who, through the love of money, sex or power, take advantage of their situation. There's been a a horrendous example this week. You you may have seen this. um, A terribly, terribly sad example was Ravi Zacharias, um, who was a, a hugely respected thinker and speaker and apologist for the gospel, died last year. But um, there has been a report released this week um, which has fully exposed his abuse of position and power for sexual gain. He was effectively sex trafficking. With the unknowing but foolish complicity of the organisation, he kept it hidden for years. And it's a deeply disturbing example of what Jesus spoke about here. And I, I mention it because it, it, the timing of it, is, as I was reading this, it just saddened my heart so much. Um, we, we knew that the report was coming. Um, but it is just such a reminder of how, how dangerous it is in positions of leadership. It's such a reminder that these warnings that Christ gives are not abstract. They're not just sort of strange things that will happen occasionally. These are real. These are things about which we must be on our guard. Now, while we recognise Jesus' warnings here, 
of what can so easily happen to those in a position of power and authority. We know that Jesus says that we know them by their fruit. That, that the, the reality of someone's life is will ultimately be exposed, revealed. But we must also allow for grace. So we recognise the seriousness of the warnings. We also have to allow for grace. We, we remember that saved people can fall far from God, can, can damage others. And yet there are those who, who, who if, they are, if they are truly saved, they, are, they will return to God. 1 Corinthians 3 speaks of those who are saved only as through fire. So we must allow for grace. But we also have to be very careful. And again, as much as anything, I speak to myself here as someone who does have a, a position of, of leadership. We have to be very careful, all believers, that we never sit back and condemn and assume, oh, I would never behave like this. The temptation to abuse God's gifts and particularly to abuse others from a position of power and influence, that temptation comes to most. We must be on our guard. Jesus is saying this, yes, to leaders, but to all disciples. In this time of waiting for his return, we must be on our guard. We need one another as well. We can guard our own hearts, but we need one another in this to, to, to help us to be on guard. To call each other to account with gentleness and grace. And humility. So in light of these warnings, well, let's ask God that we would know him more and love him more. And that our stewardship would flow from that relationship of love for God. That is the greatest safeguard that we have, is our relationship with God. Now, in light of all this, Jesus finishes this passage that we've read with a general principle in the final two verses. He says that the servant who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act according to his will receives a severe punishment. The servant who didn't know but still did wrong, he's still a servant, there's still an expectation of service but perhaps the detail he didn't know but the servant who didn't know this detail and still did wrong, he will be punished less severely. Now this is this is part of a much wider principle in scripture. As, as Romans 1 reminds us, there is enough evidence of God in creation as to leave us without excuse if we reject him. We are all held accountable. But the greater our privilege in terms of what we are what we know of God, the greater our privilege, the greater our responsibility. And Jesus finishes with that. Sobering phrase, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. We've seen this principle at work as Jesus has spoken to his fellow Jews uh, back in Luke 10. He warned them that they would be judged more severely than the Gentiles because of their knowledge of God and his word. They rejected what they knew and so they would be judged more severely. And it's a principle that they should have known. It was established in, in the Old Testament. One example is Numbers 15. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. Those who know, who know the word of God and yet who continue to ignore it and reject Christ, they are judged more severely than those who have only the evidence of the world around them of the existence of God. And again, we, we have to recognise the warning to us here. We have so much in terms of access to God's word and to biblical teaching and to one another. We've been given much as disciples. 
and therefore much will be required of us. And again, even more so from those in positions of influence and leadership. So pray for one another. This is not supposed to make us terrified or, or borne down by a guilt or a burden, but it is a, a warning we have to pay heed to. It's supposed to make us cry out for grace, for God's help, but it should also cause us to look to support one another. So pray for one another. Support one another. And please, pray for me and for others in positions of leadership. It is so important. But we can also take comfort from these words of Christ. And again, this has been something that has resonated with me uh, this week. Uh, particularly as I've I've heard about what, what happened with Ravi Zacharias. It's a comfort for us because it means that justice will be done. The Lord of the church will bring justice on those who abuse their privileges and responsibilities within the church. He says earlier in chapter 12 that what is whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. These things will not be allowed to go unchecked. God is just and God is good. So as we look forward to Christ's return, we can look forward with expectant joy. We can look forward with dependence on the grace of God and his spirit freely given to us. And so we can be good stewards because he enables it. He calls us to stewardship and he enables our stewardship. We can be good stewards of all that he has given. As a people who are always prepared for Christ's return. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come to your word with thanksgiving. But also, Lord... It can sometimes make us feel a little raw with the, the challenge of your word. Father, we hear these warnings of Christ. And in one sense we tremble, but Lord, we know we don't need to fear because we fear you, because we love you. Because you have promised to give everything that we need for life and godliness. You call us to faithful, watchful stewardship. And you give everything that we need to be faithful. To be prepared for Christ's return. And so Father we thank you. And we thank you for the wonderful promises that are here in this passage. Yes the promise to justice but also that beautiful promise that when the master returns, when our Lord returns, he invites us to an eternal banquet. He invites us to find fullness of joy. He invites us to everlasting peace. When we discover Truly what it means to live as your servants. To serve you as your hosts above as the hymn says. But also to be hosted. To be fed. To be satisfied and never want anything else. So Father in this wonderful hope. Without disregarding these warnings Lord. In this wonderful hope. Help us. Father, to look with anticipation to Christ's coming. And help us, Lord, also to help one another, not only to guard our own hearts, but to be a guard for one another. Help us to encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. That together, as the household of God in our, our local setting. That together we would be a household who are prepared. And joyfully anticipating. And joyfully proclaiming the coming return of our master. 
Thank you, Lord. And come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to, to close with 